We have a very exciting panel with us today. I'm very, very happy to, to be hosting this group of, of, of really interesting people. Bethany Judge, um, on my far right, is a queer and feminist activist and scholar, lead editor of To Have and To Hold, The Making of Same-Sex Marriage in South Africa, and she's also an adjunct professor at UCT. Welcome, Bethany. Next to her is Viv Lalu, who um, is a friend, uh, well, in fact, it feels sort of no, like a, a panel of friends, so it's a, it's a party of sorts. Um, and Viv Noah is researcher at the Dada Omar Institute at the University of Western Cape, a long time feminist activist. And then I um, was old. <laughs> <laughs> Code word. <laughs> and then on my immediate right is Dr. Klaleng Mofokeng, vice chairperson of the Sexual and Reproductive Just, um, Justice Commission. She also runs a women's clinic in Santon and works to leverage the synergy between communicators and um, advocacy for reproductive justice. Welcome to, to all of you. So, bodies as um, sites of struggle have long been a preoccupation in, in our society and other societies. And some of our obsessions in this regard have pertained to the politics of physical appearance, for example, the sizing of bodies and the way in which bodies generally are configured. The repertoire of how we present and package our bodies in terms of movement and posture and gestures. The body as an ornamental site, um, how it's decorated um, and, and presented. The body as a site of gendered identity and subjectivity. <coughs> The body located within heteronormative frameworks, and then also, um, more traumatically, the body in sites of violence. So I wanted to, to get the panel to start by thinking a bit about how bodies are socially constructed in ways that are often prescriptive, um, in terms of gender identity and what the impact of this, this has been. And I want to start that before, before um, inviting each of you to, to, to talk a bit to that by just reading a very short extract from Sandra Barkey on how bodies are socially constructed. So she says, but women's body is an ornamented, ornamented surface too, and there's much discipline involved in this production as well. Yeah, especially in the application of makeup and the selection of clothes, art and discipline converge. Although I shall argue, there's less art involved than one might suppose. A woman's skin must be soft, supple, hairless and smooth. Ideally, it should portray no sign of queer, experience, age, or deep thought. Hair must be removed, but not only from the face, but from large surfaces of the body as well. From legs and thighs, an operation accomplished by shaving, buffing with fine sand paper, or applying foul-smelling blood cheese. With the new high-leg bathing suits and leotards, a substantial amount of pubic hair must be removed too. The removal of facial hair can be more specialized. Eyebrows are plucked out by the roots with tweezers, Hot waxes sometimes fall out of the mustache and cheeks and then ripped away when it cools. The woman who wants a more permanent result may try electrolysis. This involves the killing of a hair root by the passage of an electric current down a needle that has been inserted into its base. The procedure is painful and expensive. The development of what one beauty expert calls good skincare habits requires not only attention to health, the avoidance of strong facial expressions and the performance of facial exercises, but the regular use of skincare preparations may need to be applied more often than once a day. Cleansing lotions, because ordinary soap and water upsets the skin's acid and alkaline balance. Wash off cleansers, milder than cleansing lotions, astringent toners, makeup removers, night creams, nourishing creams, eye creams, moisturizers, skin balances, body lotions, hand creams, lip pomades, sun lotions, sunscreens, and facial masks. Black women may wish to use fade creams to even skin tone. Mm. So I'm going to stop there and going to start with you, Haleng, to ask about some of the prescriptive ways in which um, we socially construct gendered ways of being in our body. I mean, so as a, someone who works, you know, as a medical doctor and I see patients every day, um, and so whether it's in clinical settings or whether I'm on TV or radio, the number one question that always comes up is, is my vagina normal? How do I make it taste and look better? Um, and what concoction can I use to make it dry? Um, so that, those are the dominant themes you know, in, in the work 
work that I do. And often you find that even with, with young women, you know, the minute you hit menstruation, everything about you and how the world relates to you is fertility. Um, and that comes across not just only in social circumstances or settings, um, it comes through in the medical industry, about how even as a young woman, if you go to a public health facility right now, and you have abnormal vaginal bleeding, the first question is, are you pregnant? Why are you pregnant? Why are you even having sex? Um, and the options for you as a young black woman with abnormal vaginal bleeding, who does probably um, you know, have a, a positive pregnancy test, the only way to enter the system is through antenatal care. And if you choose anything else, you kind of get punished for it. Um, you know, so those are some of the ways that in, in what I do on a daily basis, you know, women's bodies continue to be policed, uh, but also the system itself is not designed for affirming healthcare or in ways that um, bodies can fully be expressive of, of what they are and, and what they need, and then have those, um, you know, sexual rights and then the rights to be who you are made um, with, with equitable healthcare. So I think for me, because I see people who are ill, the number one question is, you know, for me, why do black women continue to get sick? Um, and we have to look, I think, at South Africa where we're at now, <clears throat> but the history of apartheid and how health policy was used um, as, as a tool to oppress women but also control their fertility and therefore control the black population's fertility. Um, it's, it's, it remains significant because the repercussions of that remain with us to this day. Um, and, and you know, I don't know how many of us have, you know, thought about why the sudden uh, surge in the whole menstrual cup or uh, sanitary pad drives, right? What has happened? I mean, people have always menstruated. Why now is this thing? Um, and, you know, my, my thinking around that, you know, again goes back to contraception, about how even now in townships and, and poorer co communities, um, young women, and specifically black young women, are given Depo-Povera prophylactically um, because we know how loose young women are. So as a way to control that and correct that, and because we're doing them a favor, in fact, um, young women have been given contraception often without their knowledge. They just know that they need to go back to a clinic in three months. Um, and that's how young women ask me about contraceptive. It's the three month one. I'm like, but how do you even not know the name, right? And it's easy to then just judge and say, well, Typical black girls, they are loose, they never know anything anyway, right? They never pay attention. But if you are a young black girl in a peri urban or rural area, where do you get that information? Because your own mother, your own granny, your own auntie was never a recipient of some comprehensive sexuality education. All the materials that are produced are produced in English. Um, so these are just the different types of, 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 of um, you know, issues that I'm dealing with on a daily basis and how much of these contraceptives that people don't even know they are on um, is leading to you know, all of these abnormal uterine bleeds um, that we now find ourselves having to respond to on a national scale around menstruation and sexual childs, but is that really the source, is that the problem? Because, you know, so we just need to think bigger and, how, and realize that you know, our bodies are political and more so black bodies um, and women's fertility. You can even look at Trump and, and what's happening in the US, right, around global health politics and how the, the mood has changed, the tone has changed. And all of that does impact on health policy. It does impact on health financing and funding, which means at the end of the day, those who are still dependent on state-funded uh, facilities, again, um, usually people in the rural, very urban, those who can afford um, you know, private health care, again, someone who works in Johannesburg, women who are migrants, right? who are coming across provinces or even uh, across the borders for work, men on whom will not have a proof of residence, will not have a pay slip, um, will not have an ID document, which are all the things required for you to access the health service. So the, again, the issue of intersectionality and all the different ways in which you know, black bodies, but black women's bodies have to navigate not just the physical space they occupy, but then how they, you know, for, I, I feel for me personally that the system is a closed loop. It doesn't matter where you are trying to get care or enter. Um, you know, as a black body, as, as someone with a uterus with a vagina, um, the system is almost always designed um, not for you. Yes, I, I like your, your use of the word policing um, yeah. and sort of regulatory frameworks um, and, and the very real health repercussions of the regulation of black women's bodies. Um, just before we move on to the, the, do you think that there um, is 
Yeah, what, what is your projection of something like the national health insurance system for dealing with some of these challenges? Look, I don't think the problem with South Africa is needing more money um, at the problem that we already have in the health system. The, the problems, you know, are there, have been there, and what we need is really just leadership and commitment, but being a different type of thinking. Um, for as long as, you know, health practitioners, ministers, whoever it is, think that, you know, it's, 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 or at least the way that they implement health care policy is not from a health or human rights perspective. So they think they need to make the decisions for you, and you must then just choose when you want it or not. As opposed to saying, <laughs> you know, uh, you have rights, and, and these are the, the facilities, or these are the um, uh, services available to you whenever you need them, come for services, and you, people should know that they, you know, guarantee dignity, uh, confidentiality, um, stock outs remain a problem. We don't need an NHI to fix that. Um, for example, if uh, you are a, 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 any person who requires transition um, health care, the NHI is still not for you because it's not taking into consideration the fact that um, hormonal therapy, which we're still referring as contraception, is used for more than just family planning, right? There are people who need hormones for other reasons, but if you're a young person um, who requires hormonal therapy or anything else, unless you are pregnant or trying to prevent a pregnancy, you're still not going to get access to the right combinations of drugs. Um, so, I mean, the health, at the moment, the waiting list um, for any uh, affirming surgical um, uh, care is 20 years. And we know for people um, you know, who, who require that service, many of them 20 years of their lifetime, because we know the impact of um, alienation from families and, and um, you know, uh, uh, the inner sort of um, uh, uh, family, and we know the, the predisposition to mental health issues. Um, and so 20 years is literally a lifetime. How can people still be waiting 20 years for health care? And the NHI, as it is at the moment, it's still not addressing those issues because it's still very much heteronormative in the way that health policy is written. So if you're reading any health policy, it will still talk about he and her. Um, when you're talking about sexual health education, it's still only referring at uh, penis and vagina sex and the penis penetrating the vagina. Um, so, if you are a young person, for example, who still needs that type of information, the NHI is still not, not catering for you. And the problems we have currently do not have to wait for an NHI. We don't need any more money than we already have in the business. What we do need, though, is to ask questions about um, why, for example, women's health programming in South Africa is dependent so much on foreign aid. And that foreign aid being U.S. United States um, uh, Presidential Emergency Fund for HIV. And again, why we're allowing um, foreign policy to influence our national agenda and, and national planning and implementation of programs to the extent where some of the conditions and the clause um, that non-governmental organizations have been made to sign are actually against our own constitution. Mm -hmm. You know, why is the fiscus not enough to, to cater for, for the needs of, of women and young girls um, and children? And why is it so dependent on foreign aid? And, and why does the National Department of Health, for example, depend so much on NGOs to implement their own uh, programming. Again, unfortunately, a lot of those programs are implemented by, um, I would say some of the NGOs have, are laced with the very right-wing extremist Americanism. Um, at the moment in the Eastern Cape, uh, there's a research that was done um, that shows that faith-based organizations are giving counseling for women who want to have uh, abortions. Now, which other medical procedure do you know that would allow any faith-based organization, non-medical people, no clinicians, um, to be offering medical advice and information for people who require medical procedures. But again, it's how women are viewed. It's how, um, again, the policing of the bodies is viewed. And how women, often in those circumstances, are viewed as irrational. Someone has used those words on television before. Um, and, and how we are in crisis, and we need extra help to make a decision. And I can tell you, as someone who's an abortion provider, by the time someone walks through the door and says, I need an abortion, they've made the decision. Um, you know, and it's how you give that information to enable them to make um, you know, the best uh, decisions for themselves. So there's a whole lot of, of things that are happening on a policy level that are happening in terms of access, but that are also influenced um, by, by foreign aid. And we need to question that, um, I think, a bit more and ask what the agenda is. because. You know, I, I don't know if you guys know Loretta Ross, but she, she's the mother of reproductive justice, and she speaks a lot about 
um, you know, white supremacy in the era of Trump. And in fact, for us as South Africans, we've experienced it already with George W. Bush um, during the, the, the initial reaction um, and what they called health systems strengthening in South Africa through PEPFA funding, but disintegrating and, and really breaking down what should be comprehensive public health services and focusing it only as HIV links. So unless the government needs statistics from you for HIV testing, unless they need condoms to be distributed, as a young person, the system doesn't talk to you unless it's telling you, <coughs> keep your legs closed, stay in school, don't get HIV, and burden us with more um, of these diseases. And I mean, any, any of you can think now, I mean, have you ever seen any type of health communication for young people besides HIV? Um, and then, you know, then they'll talk things about stigma. How do we destigmatize? Well, you don't destigmatize something by continuing to have black pregnant babies in front of your brochures, as if HIV is a black woman uh, pregnant problem. Um, you don't destigmatize, you know, I mean, as an undergraduate in medical education more than 11 years ago, we were still having the genitals of black people on PowerPoints when people are discussing sexual transmitted infections. Um, so the, the issue of stigma and, you know, and how bodies are viewed then by medical doctors, people that you require services from, right? They see black bodies as carriers of disease. That's how medical education is currently, um, you know, designed. So when FISMA's fall and people in campuses are talking about decolonization of curricula, these are some of the things that we're talking about. Um, and, and they are literal because they literally impact how medics take you seriously, how they view you. Um, and money won't protect you. Serena Williams, with all the money in the world, she literally almost died in childbirth mm -hmm. because ah, black women always talk too much. They always complain. Nah, 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 nah. Even when she, when she said, I'm, I'm a patient with a clotting problem and I feel unwell. Can someone check it out? And they just brushed her off. So we need to realize that you know, it doesn't matter what your privilege is, whether it's class, whether it's um, you know, the, the ability to afford private health care, or just being proximal to, to major health centers. That stuff doesn't protect you when your physical being embodies certain characteristics. Um, and therefore, that's why the whole fight for reproductive justice, for sexual reproductive justice, it's everybody's problem. Because at some point, as long as you own a vagina and a uterus, you will be stigmatized, you will be discriminated against, and everybody will think part of you, um, you know, are up to them to have an opinion on yeah. firstly, and then dictate to you, um, you know, what choices you should be making. The very real indictment of the failure of the health system, um, particularly to, to look after the health needs of black women, Viv, some of your thoughts on the ways in which um, you have negatively impacted upon the social construction of bodies in very prescriptive ways. So, so I ask for Joy's indulgence because my head has been full about women and women's bodies in the workplace. Um, and this has largely been based on the, the story about what's happened in equal education and other NGOs. I come from the NGO sector, I've worked in the social justice sector for 25 odd years. Again, referencing my age a little bit there. But, um, and I have been in spaces with many women, and women with an X in this case, as was defined. We, women that, are, that we've been talking to and engaging with around trying to begin to think about this. So I'm by no means talking to you as an expert or have my, my head is still very messy on all the things that we are processing around what it means to be a woman in the social justice sector, working in the social justice sector. But some of the things that came up for me in, that, in those conversations was the, the language around how women are constantly sexualized. And you would think that if you're working in a social justice organization, that somehow that would be different and women speak and, and, and voice this contradiction of the good work of the organization but the inability of the organization to reflect inwards to begin to grapple with how it's actually treating women and black women in particular black women's body within the work and um, there's a sense from women that they are never able to work to their full capacity 
and to thrive and to develop fully in the work environment. And I'm sure that can relate to other contexts for women as well. But in this instance, because the constant threat and possibility of microaggressions, women are con constantly having to be prepared for it. Even if it doesn't happen every day, there's a good chance it may. So you're always prepared for the possibility of microaggressions. And microaggressions exist in the context of a normality around patriarchy and how those things function. And so women are making choices every day about, am I confronting this, am I not? If I do confront it, I'm going to be labeled a black angry woman and that, what does that mean? So, and so the levels of stress and the level of anxiety and the levels of, of, of just the, the difficulties that women face daily in just being able to exist in whatever spaces they inhabit with their bodies was just, it just struck me and it, it makes me angry actually and it makes me sad and it's just a whole mix um, of, of emotions that come over me when I, when I reflect as a woman but also listening to other women and their experiences of what it feels like to be doing this good work and the consequences and effects on women and their bodies and how they feel every day. But are you talking specifically about, are you talking generally or is this within the social justice sector? Well, I think, I'm sure we can apply generally. The spaces I've been in lately have been women working in the social justice sector. Sure. But I'm sure that it's not a coincidence that these conversations are happening at the same time when internationally people are thinking and talking around about sexual harassment that women endure, but also situating sexual harassment in a bigger sort of context of patriarchy. And so, and, you know, it's, it's very significant that for women involved in, yesterday at the launch of the Nasty Women book, there, there was a point at which we reflected a bit about um, bodies contributing to resistance and social equity and justice. And so for, for women involved in that layer of work, and it's important in terms of the value it brings to society, um, but the levels of fatigue and health and mental health issues that come with being involved in that sort of work that often doesn't pay very well, but it takes a tremendous toll um, and is a tremendous work in terms of, of, of what it brings to changing and creating a different kind of society. Um, before we move on to it, you're going to just talk about, uh, and I'm not sure if you're comfortable with this, but some of the, the personal impact of some of that stuff for you working in that space. I think that, that, that personally, yeah, the, the, the things that you reflect, so feeling exhausted um, and feeling despondent um, sometimes. I have to confess um, mm -hmm. that I do sometimes feel despondent. And in the spaces that, the recent space um, that we were in, young, much younger women entering the social justice sector are speaking of the same things. And that made me quite sad that still, I'm, I'm an older woman, I've been in the sector, but new women coming into it are experiencing the exact same things that, that I experienced as a young woman 25 odd years ago. And that is a real serious um, indictment. And, and women, but, but they, um, I have to tell you that, that women are not in the business of feeling sorry for themselves for long because the, the conversations also moved into, into what, what, can, what can be done and what can we do and what have we done and what have worked and also just appreciating that sometimes women may choose to stay silent and sometimes women may choose not to, but to, to not judge women for when they choose not to always be the one having to fight. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a sense of generosity and women trying to find spaces to support each other. And so even though I was despondent and exhausted and drained, that coming together and, and the, the idea of solidarity and building solidarity, which I know is a, something that Melanie speaks about quite often as well, um, that was quite encouraging for me. Thank you. Let me some of your thoughts. I'm old, so I have to start talking about solidarities. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, just a couple of things that kind of link to what both Kalen and, and Viv have been talking about. I mean, for me, and to loop it back to the politics of the body, which is sort of the topic of this conversation, um, 
I mean, the gendered body is a battleground. Um, and I think women's bodies are the frontier of that battleground. And all of the things we've been talking about already are about the investment in disciplining that body. So the way that Bart Keith talks about it, and there'll be free cosmetic samples um, outside <laughs> after today. But I mean, the perpetual attempts to, um, to discipline and control, particularly the body that's gendered as female, but bodies that are gender non-conforming. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, what's interesting is that that puts the body really in the sight of power. That the body is the way in which power is exercised. That we've been talking about heteronormative power, patriarchal power. So it's through the body that you get to control the social, the political, and the economic. Um, and I think that. You know, just to pick up on the, on the point that Clalem was making around, you know, you seeing people who, in a sense, are sort of um, diagnostically ill. But the female body is already ill. It's already impure. It's already mad. It's already dirty. I mean, and that's part of the patriarchal construction of the female body. And so all the plucking and tucking and is about trying to make this body, this impure, dirty, and in the case of black women, hypersexualized body, a pure body, a good body, often like an infantilized body, actually like the playgirl vagina thing, a young infantilized pure body. And I think for us as feminist activists, what I think is the challenge is not to get caught into the trap of the, the wanting to accomplish this perfect pure body. Because that's the bullshit ruse of patriarchy that we must spend our lives trying to discipline our bodies so that we accomplish this perfect sense of femininity, which is already race. I mean, femininity itself is already, you know, is, can't be disentangled from white femininity. Um, and so for me, the feminist dimension that I want to bring in, you know, is about resisting the attempt to accomplish gender. So we have to fail. We have to be impure women, we have to be impure men, we have to be impure trans people. We have to get away from these binaries that are really about controlling the social, the political, and the economic. And I think there's a lot at stake. And that's where the issue of you know, these feminist conversations that have been happening recently, I think many put, women are literally putting their, and queer people are putting their, line, their bodies on the line, are resisting this attempt to control and discipline. And the backlash is immense, basically. Um, and I think the younger generation, I'm also old like you, but <laughs> the younger generation are calling it out big time. And the question is, where are we? Where are the rest of we? Where are we when people are calling out and saying, you know, my body won't be your playground, this is what harassment is, and I get to define it. <coughs> Um, so I think the terms of gender and gender relations are under renegotiation. Um, and I hope we don't settle into another failed negotiation. But this, this process of negotiating what gender means huh, at the level of identity, uh, and I think there's a lot of very exciting trans and queer work that's happening around redefining what gender identity means, but there's also the negotiation around what does it mean in space? What does it mean in place? How do we greet people? Do we have to, are we still wanting to be obsessed with gender marking? This kind of ladies and gentlemen, fantastical idea of how the world operates. Do we need to change our language completely? How do, how, you know, men are being called to think about how they sit and don't sit. And I'm also very mindful of <laughs> Decidedly gendered fashion. So let me just, just, just wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose the last point I want to make just to, is the issue of context, or the social material context in which we live. And I think that brings us to, to, to the fact that we are not only ever only gendered, we are also raced, we are classed, we occupy certain professional statuses, and all of those are sites of power, right? So we might, for example, you know, feel the disciplining, you know, let's say as a, as a white woman, feel the disciplining of what it is to be a female-bodied subject and have to conform to all these gender 
uh, uh, codes um, uh, of conduct, but I, and, and there I feel a sense of, of, of being disempowered or rendered vulnerable, right, because of my gender. But I'm also a white person, and with that kind of power comes another form of power. Um, and that my whiteness, in a sense, can often be used to guard against, to keep myself safe from certain forms, forms of gendered violence. So I just want to put in the issue of a whole other set of conditions that are very, very material, that shape how we understand the gendered body and what's possible and impossible um, for, for us as individuals and as, 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 as a collective. Yeah, I'm meeting you. I, I chaired a session yesterday, um, a space for persons of trans experience and, and women who, people who identify as women, women with an ex. Um, and I think that what was overwhelming and very deeply emotive was that the thread of that entire hour and a half conversation became about sexual violence. And the very real stories of some of the, the things that you're talking about, how when people don't conform, what the very real repercussions for their lives are, and, and often, you know, how um, there are acts of violence um, towards those who don't conform. And so there were stories, for example, from, you know, people, um, one, one woman before she had transitioned to going to a boys' school, and, and because being othered and different within that space, um, you know, was subjected to the most brutal acts of violence. And you know, it, it, it reminded me how we are socialized at very young ages to, to be a part of this machinery of conforming and how the system works in very clear ways to catch us from when we're very young. So I want to, to, to move a little bit to, to thinking a bit about um, the, the links between bodies as, as sites of violence, and I want to read a little bit from um, from Melanie's book called Blackwashing Homophobia, where she talks about the notion of displacing men taking on masculinity. So she writes, the cause of violence against lesbians is frequently attributed to the behaviors of hateful and intolerant men who as a result of being threatened by lesbians act violently towards them a naturalized antagonism between men as the defenders of normative gender relations and lesbians as gender transgressors is thus established. Violence against lesbians is described as the result of a masculinized defense of a gender order in which women are required to assume a particular role, one that the lesbian clocks. Consequently, she poses a danger to men's gender status and power, thus provoking their violence. In particular, men's acts of violence are attributed to the insecurities and or powerlessness that lesbians invite by disrupting male power and place in the patriarchal system. In the extracts above, the insecurity, rejection, and disempowerment of men are deemed to cause their violence. And so this was following some extracts of I think, focus group sessions that, that you had done. Melanie, can you talk to us a little bit more about this notion of men's power being displaced? And I want you to, to, to talk to it in the context of um, you use the notion of feminized self-care as a strategy that is employed mm. where we have to look after our own needs and sense of keeping ourselves safe, protecting ourselves. Thanks. Um, so a couple of things, I suppose this issue of how the, the lesbian subject um, is seen to challenge masculinity, to, to, to do two things, to displace masculinity or male body masculinity, and then also to, to stake a claim on masculinity. And that's where the gender nonconformity is seen as problematic. So the butch lesbian or the gender nonconforming person, more generally, who's actually make, potentially making a claim on a masculinity that they're not, they're not seen to legitimately have a right to, in a way. Um, and, and I think what happens in that displacing masculinity dynamic, and I want to raise it immediately because it also came up in a way in some of the conversations of the Nasty Woman launch, is that it's very easy to slip into the male is victim discourse, right? See, men are say having such a hard time because they're threatened, and you know the, the masculinity is threatened by lesbians and queer people, and you know it's really really hard for them. And they need to be helped to find a new place in a new world, and and I think we must really resist that men as victims. I think men's power, assumed power, is under necessary pressure. Uh, and there's going to be a necessary pushback because what part of changing social power relations 
is it kind of works a bit like this. Some people are going to have to give up a little bit of their power in order for power to be a little bit more equitable. And I think when one's power is challenged, as a middle class person, as a white person, as a, as a man, one gets defensive. Nobody wants to relinquish power, right? So, and it's easy to then try and position oneself as a victim. That doesn't answer your question at all, but anyway, I'm just trying to keep like it. I want to give men a bit of a hard time. Um, and then I suppose the feminized self-care is linked to, okay, so then, if, if men are a victim um, of an onslaught of gendered bodies that they don't really understand and that threaten, them, threaten their sense of identity, then the extension of that is, well, the queer body or the gender non-conforming body is to blame somehow for the victim because they're making the world uncomfortable. And so, sorry, for the violence. So they're blamed for the violence that they, that they are then subjected to. It's that whole thing of, well, you know, I mean, it's a bit like for women in general. Like, if you wore that skirt, what were you thinking? So, I mean, if you're like butch and you're out at like one in the morning and whatever, what, what, what were you thinking, you know? And you tell some guy to bugger off because he says something, what were you thinking? So the idea that the queer body already provokes and therefore is to blame for the violence. And the extension of that is, we must then keep ourselves safe. Nothing should change in the social order. We must take precaution as women and as queers. And the precaution gets us back to Bartke. It's better if you kind of try and look like that pure woman, right? If you do enough plucking and whatever, eyebrowing and whatever, and you conform to femininity, it's better for you. And that we get, that's the cycle. Then we get back into the self-regulation. And in a sense, we are then saying to queers, keep yourselves safe. Instead of saying, let's shift the lens to where the power is situated. Because it's from, you know, violence, and I write about it in the book, is an instrument of power. It's a way of exerting power over people to keep them in their place. And when women and queers and others are saying, we don't want to be in that place anymore, actually, we are contesting <coughs> your right to be in a place of power and our right to be in a place of inferiority, uh, that's when the, the real contestation and the real battle, and the political battles at least, start, start to emerge. I mean, before we move away from you, I'm just uh, I'm very keen for you to maybe just talk a little bit about the term blackwashing homophobia, so to help us understand what you mean by that and your association, or how you talk about violence being associated with black people, um, through various social and spatial specifications. Okay, so the, sh the short answer, because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a concept in, in progress, but what I was trying to do with the idea of blackwashing homophobia is I was trying to think race and sexuality alongside one another. I think it's impossible in the South African context, in a post-colonial context, to try and think about race and sexuality as disarticulated, as disconnected. So I want to because sexualities are racialized and race is sexualized. And that is very much speaks, and the way that those things happen very much speaks to the histories of slavery, colonialism, and apartheid. So that's what I was ultimately trying to do. And within that, I was trying to suggest that there is a narrative that tries to situate violence with blackness. In other words, to say blackness is the problem, and this is, an apart this is a racist trope of apartheid, right? It's the Swat Khafar discourse. That blackness is a source of violence, whiteness is not, whiteness is totally outside of violence. Okay, whiteness, whiteness is civilization, and civilization isn't violence. Okay, I'm putting it crudely. And blackness is, in a sense, is both the target and the source of violence. And I think that homophobia is sometimes, not always, understood in that frame, and you see it when there's this idea of, oh, you know, African people, whoever that refers to, are naturally homophobic, right? And I'm trying to write against that idea, because I don't, homophobia is about power, I don't think anybody is naturally prejudiced, and it's problematic if you're trying to suggest that some people are naturally prejudiced, and therefore other people are naturally not, are naturally more liberal, are naturally more progressive, are naturally, <coughs> in a sense, superior, I mean, it kind of gets you to to how great the West is and how, how crap Africa is. So, so, so blackwashing is trying to grapple um, with that. And also, finally, maybe, to, it's, it's, it also wants to say that, that sexuality, uh, sexual politics is necessarily also about racial politics. 
And again, we need to theorize and do our activism and do our engagements, thinking about those things alongside one another, rather than separately. That they inextricably link to each other. Yeah. Sure. And then, can, can you talk to us a bit, uh, you know, given your, your long expertise in the healthcare sector, about the, the mental and health impact on women of living in a violent society and being, having to contain with gender-based violence, the threat of it, the fear of it, the actual acts of it, the psychological impact of it? That's a big one. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that we need to, to be firm on is this idea that real men don't rape, right? Men rape, rapists are men, and they are real. They are not these imaginations of people's, you know, uh, making up. They, they are real, and they are raping people. So that's one of the first things, because language gives meaning, right? Um, and the, the whole thing of Oh, Dalai was raped. No, no, no. Someone raped me. So if a man raped me, then it must, the headline must read, a man rapes Dalai. Because now that's an action, that's a person who's identifiable. And it doesn't then portray me as a victim. And in the context of rape culture, we know victim blaming and shaming is a real thing. So people are already offered, you know, on a silver platter, as if everything around that activity centered around the victim, and it's not. So that's one of the first things around um, uh, violence and, and the things that I'm working with. And I think that's only because I also produce content, sexual health education content. So a lot of it is deliberate in how we use language. Um, consent is a big thing. Um, people still don't understand that consent is important, not just for sexual activity or sexual um, um, engagement, but can I hug you? Can I shake your hand? We need to start normalizing consent outside of sex so that not only will people expect um, to be asked for consent, but that, that consent will be respected. Because it's often what happens after I have said no, that then determines whether violence happens or not. Um, and that's something that I always try to get through to young people, is that um, it's not that we saying, if you don't want to have sex in a certain way, it must mean the end of the relationship. Because a lot of young people, and as adults, some of us are married, some of us, have long-term partners, what does it mean for your relationship after you have said no? And it often depends on the person who's hearing that no. Um, and so how do we help young people navigate relationships? How do we give them the language to actually then talk and communicate and discuss issues around consent when a relationship wants to carry on? Um, saying no to a certain sex position, for example, doesn't have to lead to a breakup of a relationship. It really isn't that big of a deal. But because of the violence associated with a person saying no, that's what makes it a big deal. Um, so we, we need to really start, all of us, normalizing the issue of consent because people who respect other people's space, bodies, consent, um, do not violate those bodies. But I think it, it also starts very early, just in terms of socially how certain things um, are done. You know, whose vagina is this? For a lot of black girls, it's your father's because you need to uphold his good family name by being a good girl. Um, it, it belongs to your church or your pastor because the Bible says whatever it claims to say. I don't know because I'm one of those people. Um, you, know, um, you know, your vagina then belongs to the district if you want to, if, to further education in Tudela, in, in KZN. Because they, women who need tertiary bursaries, um, education, they still get subjected to virginity testing. And the concept of a hymen right, is completely flawed, which means the idea of testing people for virginity is also completely flawed. But here's this thing that has been elevated to a point where it's interfering with young women's ability to get an education. You know, I always say that a hymen and or virginity is not academic merit. And, but for young women, you have to jump all these hurdles before you can even get that bursary. And it escalates, because if you then want to get a, a, a bursary to study medicine in Cuba from the department of um, KZN, they will either put an implant in you, if you say no, you don't get the bursary, right? So not only is the violence physical, the violence is systemic, the violence is in policy, the violence, and, and we need to realize that the health system failures are themselves violence, right? 
Because if you are, again, we know the rates of um, uh, sexual and, and physical violence in South Africa. Where will you go right now in this room with all of us and the, the kind of demographic is here? Where will you go at 2 o'clock in the morning? Half of you probably have no idea if something had to happen to you. Um, so what more than other people who are already marginalized by the different intersections? Um, and where people are then unfortunately arriving at the, the post-trauma centers and there are no um, clinicians who are trained in forensic medicine. So they have to sit for three, four, five, six hours, sometimes up to two days, just waiting for someone um, to take DNA samples for forensic kit, right? Um, you, you have, you know, people who, are, who are, could have prevented a pregnancy, could have prevented, um, you know, contracting HIV, but because of the delays and the failures in the system, people find themselves with unwanted and unsupportable pregnancies, and unfortunately people have contracted HIV and other STIs because of system failures. So even those failures have to be seen within the context and the fact that they themselves are violence. Mm. Um, and, and, but the, the, the tendency is to South Africa is to separate the system. Um, from the society and from everything else. But who is in the system? It's the people. And unless the humans in the system um, are aligned to rights, um, you know, having a rights-based framework, um, then you, you, you're not going to have policy that's designed properly. You're not going to have budgeting and line items um, that are there for need of victims. Um, I mean, someone just recently, um, you know, experienced some really, really um, hectic trauma um, in, an attempt, in an attempted abduction, right? And that person is still sitting here without post trauma counseling because where do they go? You know, where do you go for that? Um, so the, 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 the issue of trauma and the stress is, is very real. Um, I know, because when I go overseas and I, wherever I'm working, I need to remind myself to not cl you know, cling to my bag. I need to remember to just relax when I'm walking around. And it's still profound to me that I could walk around the streets for an hour, two hours, and no one is telling me about the size of my boobs or what my buttocks look like or anything like that. It's still profound. It's still something that you're like, oh my gosh, that hasn't happened. But it's only when you have the privilege of going outside of the eye of the hurricane that you can sometimes appreciate what you are dealing with on a daily basis. And I think the issue with stress and trauma for women, especially in South Africa, we actually have no idea how difficult we have to navigate daily lives. Mm. Um, and really, it's, it's really only because sometimes some of us get to come out of the pressure cooker. And for so long, we still, we then we end up thinking that's normal, right? Yes. We think it's normal to be groped. We think it's normal for people to call out, you know, and, and call you names. And therefore, that normalized trauma and, um, you know, takes its toll because at the core, you can feel something is wrong. You know that, you know, you've been violated, but, if, if that's what seems to be normal, um, and and it doesn't matter where you go, you know whether it's police stations, the same patriarchy, the same violence gets repeated. Whether it's healthcare systems, whether it's social development systems, whether it's in the workplace, capitalism, you know, it's a big thing. Um, it, it, it's, it's in so many different ways, and we don't get a break, right? So whether it's in getting off a public transport and trying to get home safely, just that hundred meter walk can be the most dangerous walk you are doing every day of your life. Um, so the, I mean, then there's medical research, right, to show that things like, um, you know, the diseases of, of, of stress are a real, real, real thing. Um, and how many of us are literally just dropping dead. Um, yeah. You talk about, you know, the, the, those normalized, based, um, normalized condition of being possibly susceptible to violence within a public space, but it's also very normalized and drilled within our private spaces. And so, you know, you have the stress coming from both sides, both within the home and from public spaces. And, 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 and you're right, you know, the very real health implications of the long-term impact of all of that. Yes. And the racial stuff, right? So, I mean, someone, I can't remember who it was recently, they just made an example about how, for example, black men worry about the white boss, right? But white women worry about the white boss and the black man boss. They come home and they're worrying about the patriarchy again in the household. So no matter where you, you go, know. as a woman, it, it, everything is stacked up against you, right? Um, and I think that's, for me, the biggest thing is also how do we define ownership with our, within all of these, um, you know, battles. And the microaggressions, you know, it's very intense because you, you may go into spaces that you think are safe, right? But they're not safe. Um, and, and how are we having honest conversations about the added level of stress that even within 
excuse me, spaces as, as women, right? There's certain things that we can't take for granted, um, that just because we are all women, we are all for the same thing. Now, I'll give you an example. Um, in, in the United States, there was a, a march um, in February, I think, two days after the inauguration, and women were marching against, you know, the cut in contraceptive access and all of that. Um, and of course, the cold wax come out in numbers in the streets, and people did show up in the streets. But a few months before, black women were calling out to say, come out in the streets, our children are being murdered, we are being murdered in the streets, right? But there was no ally that came out to the streets with them. But now that in the global south, we've been saying for so many years, almost a decade, that look, your foreign policy, your foreign aid is causing problems for women in the global south. And no one was doing anything. Now on the Women's March, they're expecting the same black bodies to come out again in the streets because now their domestic access to contraception is now under, under um, attack. So we need to talk about that level. You know, it, it, it kind of sometimes gets you off guard because you think you're safe, so you relax. But there are definite, um, I think, gender battles and struggles that um, you know, black women further navigate, um, even within spaces that we think um, or we take for granted that they're safe. Yeah. Um, and it's around eldership and what does it look like and, and, and you know, when do we show up for each other. You know. It's a very real issue. We're going to have to take um, one or two questions from the floor, but before doing that, but very quickly, in a sentence or two, tell us about what all of this means for feminist activism. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm going to do that to you because I'm people like that. Sure. I think I'll have to take that bottle of wine. <laughs> I actually don't know how to answer you. And I think that, and I have come to a place where I'm okay with actually being able yeah. to say, I actually don't know what that looks like. I think it's still really messy. I've just, before I came here, I came from a meeting where we are planning another space for women to come together in the Western Cape to talk about issues of, of what it's like to work in the social justice sector. And in there we are saying, we need to think differently as feminists about creating these spaces so that they can be organic and they can build on each other without claiming each other and wanting to you know, hold each other to a rigid format um, and that we are able to create these multiple spaces and that we find ways of connecting them in non-traditional organic ways. So I think in like more than two sentences, that's my answer to your question is the rethinking <coughs> of how we normally do things. And as feminists, we need to put a feminist lens on that and rethink how we do that. <laughs> it will be at the end. I knew you wouldn't disappoint, but um, we now get to open up to just take comments. Or if they, if they don't have to be questions because this is important to actually don't necessarily have all the answers. It's the comments or questions for the panel. Is there anybody? One, two. Anybody else? Three and four. Everyone, thank you so much for being here. Um, Melanie, was it? Melanie. Um, I just wanted to comment on what you were saying because I found it so interesting that you were saying how black people are often seen as being homophobic, which is which is true. Not that black people are homophobic. I'm saying that we are often looked at as being homophobic, and I think the irony of that is that before being colonized. We didn't look at gender. I mean, if you look at our languages, our languages don't even have gendered terms. It's just us, we, them, you know? And um, I was also thinking of um, Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, 1989 um, thesis that she basically wrote, the, inter the demarginalization of intersections between sex and race, a black woman's guide. And what intersectional feminism is, is essentially black woman feminism. And this was a black woman in the 80s that was talking about the fact that sex and race definitely um, intersect, the way we look at sex intersect as black people. And I find it so interesting that even though uh, this whole black woman spoke about this in the 80s, it's still a, a misconception that black people are homophobic. But this is only now becoming a change in, in terms of white feminism where intersections are even starting to become, like, become noticed. Before there was no conversation among white women about intersections. It was, I mean, if we look at the, the march for what was it, Trump, the, with those hats, the, the pink hats, yeah. Um, I mean, just that in of itself just shows how 
backwards um, white feminism is. The fact that we have to march out in the streets with our, our white counterparts and be allies to them, be black bodies for them, to carry their messages as we've done for generations. And then the disrespect... I'm so sorry to do this to you, but we get to run out of time and I want to... Oh, oh no, I was just going to say, the disrespect that you were, like, you only see this pink hat, and it's just a representation of our bodies aren't even viewed as being valuable or a type of body. It can only be pink or, yeah, that is the, the standard. No I must apologise that I've created such a little time for no. interaction. So I'm going to ask the other speakers to be quick sticks and to... I actually have an answer for you to probably mm. get that crunch over. Sorry, conversation. Yeah, she talks about gentrification of intersectionality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's the fact that um, there's theories and frameworks that have existed for many decades, right? Um, and for whatever reason now, it seems the intersectionality is now like in vogue, mm -hmm. but even what people don't understand is that she made a legal argument centering black women, and but now people are using it, words like deconstructing intersectionality, thinking of intersectionality, post-apartheid, white women, like what are you even saying? Like the, that was a framework specifically centering black bodies, but again, um, the gentrification is how it's now brought in as if it's this yes. crystal and new thing. thing, again erasing the work of black women, yeah. Okay, good afternoon everyone. So my question is to the doctor. So you spoke about how um, the healthcare system looks at um, young black bodies. How do we change that aspect that you spoke about pragmatically to look at um, black children's bodies, specifically women, from a, hu from a human rights aspect rather than looking at them as objects or um, using their bodies as sites of diseases or violence? Um, I just, I don't know if this is working, but um, I really want to just honor you all for doing the courageous and consistent and work. Pass the mic to the oh. She has it. <laughs> Thanks. I was saying I want to honor you all for doing the courageous and consistent work that you're doing. And for myself, speaking as an immigrant uh, with two daughters born and raised in this country, um, an observation that I've got because I can listen with an internal and an external ear, um, I want to suggest a bit of a caution that we don't also buy into this narrative that everything outside of this context is safer, um, because I would beg to differ, that's not the experience that I've had um, living here for 25 years. Um, and also something that was a bit of a question for me is I really don't quite understand the idea or a notion that gets promoted that somehow whiteness offers a sense of safety against sexual violence. So I may have misunderstood that as a comment, but I think it needs to be clarified because we would not want either of those messages to be carried out of this space, especially I don't want because then I have to try to clean it up later. <laughs> so, um, yeah. The last input from the floor, and then we're going to have very good responses from <clears throat> It was down here. Hi guys, thank you again. I just wanted to ask to please speak on secondary trauma, because I think uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and misconception around that, so how do we... Yeah, thank you. You give me first. <laughs> okay, I'm making one. I'm going to make two quick comments, and maybe we can continue this conversation um, afterwards around what I was trying to say. I'm trying to problematize this idea that whiteness is a place of safety and outside of violence, and blackness is a place of violence. That's what the work of, of which you can buy. It's on sale. <laughs> the work of the book tries to do. Ultimately, it's a denial of the violence of whiteness. Whiteness is pivots on violence. It's violence against others, but, it's, but the internal disciplining of whiteness through violence. I mean, the white heteropatriarch uses violence against white women, against white children. So it's, it's used, the idea of whiteness as safe is the denial of the fact that whiteness is absolutely dripping of violence, is, is, the, is the crude answer. Or engagement. I just want to throw in a provocation about Crenshaw. I think, I think one must caution the idea that theories are being co-opted. I think a 
feminist anti-racist project is a counter-hegemonic project. We're trying to challenge a white heteropatriarchal hegemony. Wouldn't the world be wonderful if we were operating socially on the basis of the thinkings of Kimberly Crenshaw, of Audre Lorde, of Sylvia Tamale? That for me is a radical prospect rather than an idea that that's a bad thing. So I'm suggesting that the popularization of these theories um, are, are important. They can be abused and co-opted for sure, but I think one shouldn't get into the slippage that it's a bad thing if people are starting to use these theories as to, to advance a feminist anti-racist project. Yeah. I think we are differ a lot with that because they're not doing it with the understanding of what it was. So they're not reading Kimberly Crenshaw. They're just using the word. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. And they, they're using it to uncenter or decenter the black bodies that that argument was making. So you can't separate my blackness from my womanhood or from my womanhood from my blackness. And therefore there must be systems and ways of the world that's designed for that. And that's why we can then advance to queer politics and queer theory from that. But if you're not even, and if it's not, um, uh, 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 I can't remember the, the person's name, but if you can't even cite Crenshaw properly, if you can't even, the, the erasure, I think, of black women is, that she's an example, and I think because we're in feminist spaces, the language and the technicalities and the elitism of the words, you know, we, we start going to Crenshaw. But she is just an example within the spaces. But I think the erasure, the, the systemic violence of erasure of black women remains. I was speaking to people about Saki Batman um, in Uganda last week, and they don't know her name, but you know what they recognize? Venus Hottentot. That is a problem. So it's not a credential thing, but it, 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 it magnifies itself in different spaces where you go. Um, if you think about medicine and all these advances and the, 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 um, the discoveries, you know, of, of even the G-spot is named after a man, you know. So the erasure of, of, of the treacherous itself as an organ of sexual, sexual pleasure, it's erased in medical textbooks. Gynecologists read two sentences of that and that's it. So the issue of erasure is a problem um, and I think we, we have to talk about it because, it, it, again, um, it, it, it's as if black women are mules for, this, for, for the movement, you know, but we never the beneficiaries when the time comes. Um, and that's why I mean the, the issue of land, you know, I'm only interested in land for women. Um, and we'll only be fighting for that. Um, you know, so that we work it, the land the most, we produce most of the food from there, you know, we're still taking care of families, we, all of everything that the land needs is already been done by women. But when the, you know, when this cut, the pie is cut, I doubt we, <laughs> we'll even get the crumbs. Uh, so we need to stay woke on the land issue both. Because <laughs> um, yeah, the land is actually a metaphor. If you think of what's happening to our bodies, right? I mean, if you think of the, the early research around HIV, who were the people who were given the data? It was black women who are pregnant. You know why? They could be threatened with being kicked out of international care unless they took an HIV yeah. test. And they did it because why? We have proof they had unprotected. So already you've proved a couple of things in your research questions. Um, and, and so, where are those black women stories being told? Who's writing those stories, right? When, if you look at the, 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 the case for the ARVs, you know, it was initially around getting um, the health system to provide antiretrovirals to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Where are those stories of those black women? Right. So the erasure, especially South Africa, I think perhaps, you know, even globally, it is a big thing that we have to deal with. And I completely forgot what you had asked me to do. <laughs> but, um, the question there was how do we change the healthcare system to make sure that it's, right, it's catering for people. I think that advocacy has to be multiple all at the same time. So we need to demand that, um, you know, the health policy gets reviewed. Because if, not if, the health department is still implementing apartheid designed policies, which still marginalized and violate black bodies. So we need to, we need to demand that that changes. Um, we need to demand, again, the issue of fiscal money and, and, and budgets and, and who funds what and what's the agenda. Um, obviously, we need to take part. 2019 elections are coming. You know, unless we're going to demand to have manifestos which place women first, um, we're still going to have the repetition because we're going to have old men, black men in the positions of power. Again, they only view the battle won because they are not the new boss. Right? 
they're not really interested and committed into changing the systems of oppression. And for as long as we have people in power who are not interested in shifting the power and just being the new boss, we're not going to get anywhere. So we need to demand um, accountability, but on all systems, all at the same time. Um, which is why advocacy and civil society support is important because a lot of us are doing this work unsupported and unremunerated and we will get tired. Um, and the issue, what happens then when, you know, the, and, and remember the cost is really, and it's personal. Um, you can't be going against all of these things and there are no repercussions. Um, and, and what does, I mean, the issue of self-care becomes another gentrified idea. You know, self-care was never about manicures and massages and scented candles. If that works for you, that's fine, because that's where you add, right? But it was about what the violence of the system does to black bodies and how as black bodies we need to react to that. And again, to our allies, it's fine if we have in self-care circles and lighting candles, but the point is there is much more um, depth to what it means to be every day in the line of violence and what that self-care would look like. So if you want to really practice self-care, Get the woman who's the cleaner at your department and teach her about tax. Ask her what her passions are. Mm -hmm. Link her to services and other things. That is for me what an ally and self-care would look like. Not elitism again around, you know, massages and candles. <laughs> Sorry, but... We've run out of time and I do apologize that we've not had much time for interaction, but the panelists will be around for a bit, so please feel free to hang around and engage with them. A big thank you to all of you and thank you for being a fantastic audience. Because at some point, as long as you own a vagina and a uterus, you will be stigmatized, you will be discriminated against, and everybody will think part of you, um, you know, are up to them to have an opinion on it firstly and then dictate to you. Um, you know, what choices you should be making.